The next topic is threads of the sacred groups. So what are the threads under the sacred groups? So these threads vary from one community to another. The first thread to be noted down is earlier there were traditional values surrounding the sacred groups. Now it has turned into superstition and hence the sacred groups are being deleted from the community. And the next thing is due to rapid urbanization and encroachment of land, the sacred groups are being degraded. And then the next thing is there is a term called as Sanskritization. Earlier the people were worshipping natural events like the trees, the stones and all. Now it has turned into temple worship. So from natural worship there is a shift to the temple worship. This is called as Sanskritization. And the next thing is uh, invasion of weed. There was a previous UPSC question regarding the invasive species. Invasive species is a species that does not belong to that region and comes from some other region and dominates this region. An example of invasive species is Prosopis julifera. So this weed species is a serious threat to the sacred groups. And then the last threat is due to pressures of livestock and fuel collection, the sacred groups are being degraded. That is, it's being cut off. The whole forest ecosystem is being cut off for the living organisms. So these are the threats related to the uh, sacred groups. And the next thing is coming to exports. So we export some kind of animal products, uh, then the wood products from uh, India to various countries. So there is a limited amount on these exports. So what are those? So first, some items are prohibited from export. So what are those? First thing is, wild animals are not supposed to be exported. And then animal articles, including the uh, horns of uh, deer and all, are not supposed to be exported. And then the beef of cows, cattle, and then meat of buffalo, and then peacock tails and feathers, she shells, wood and wood products are not supposed to be exported and then fuel wood and then wood charcoal and then uh, when coming to the sandalwood you are not supposed to export sandalwood in raw terms but uh, you can make it into a furniture and then you can export like sandalwood oil sandalwood chair sandalwood wardrobe like that you can export and then uh, red sanders is kind of a sandalwood which is red in color uh, those sandalwoods are also not supposed to be exported and then these are the list of items which are prohibited goods which are not to be exported and then coming to the global initiative so uh, global initiatives such as the map program so man and animal biosphere reserve so these this is very important so coming to the map it was introduced in early 1970s so uh, what is a MAB? MAB is a kind of intergovernmental organization. So it is an intergovernmental scientific program aiming to improve relationship between the environment and the people globally. So uh, if you have an environment here, here and there are people situated inside that, there should be a good relationship between the people living in there and the environment. So this is a scientific relationship. So it is a scientific program also, uh, which fosters to develop the relationship. So this is called as MAP program. And then coming to the uh, MAP, under this we have the Biosphere Reserve. So biosphere reserve is kind of a very very important topic. So let's move into the biosphere reserve. So under biosphere reserve it is the International Coordinating Council that is the ICC International Coordinating Council of the UNESCO introduced the biosphere reserve. So this biosphere reserve the term and what and all should be what and all should contribute the biosphere reserve comes under the ICC that is the International Coordinating Council which is under the UNESCO which designates the uh, Biosphere Reserve or which introduced the Biosphere Reserve and the next thing is it was launched in 1976 so the Biosphere Reserve concept all over the all over the world that is globally it was introduced in 1976 and then it was introduced to develop the natural and environmental coexistence. So when people and environment coexist, the relationship should be increasing. And then sites established by countries and recognized by UNESCO's MAP program. So how do you recognize a place as a biosphere reserve? So it is 
recognized by a country. For example, if India is recognizing a place as a biosphere reserve, first India lists down the biosphere reserve and then it is recognized by the UNESCO's map. We already saw the map program. It is an intergovernmental scientific program. So this map recognized that area in India as a biosphere reserve. So it is done accordingly. And then totally in India, there are 18 biosphere reserves and in that 11 biosphere reserves are recognized as world network of biosphere reserves. So we'll move into the 18 and the 11 biosphere reserves finally. So I'll uh, tell a trick to remember the 18 biosphere reserves and in 2019, there was a reflection of prelims question. So please go into the biosphere reserve in detail. So there are totally 18 biosphere reserves in that the first 11 biosphere reserves are enlisted in the world network of biosphere reserves. So let's learn this through a song. Nilagiri, Gulf of Mannar, Sundarbans, Nanda Dev, No crack, Panchmari, Simply Par. Great Nicobar, Rachanakmar, Amar Kanta, Kagastiya Malay, Kanjan Junga, National Park, National Park, Run of Kach, Kohal Desert, Sita Chalam Panna, De Hang De Bang, Manas De Bru. And then coming to the National Biosphere Reserve Program. So I already said y'all, India will take a biosphere reserve and enlist it. And later what will happen is the UNESCO's uh, map will recognize that area as a biosphere reserve. So for enlisting that, in India we need a program or committee. So consistently we had the National Biosphere Reserve Program to enlist. So it was brought in 1986. So this concept was brought in 1976 and after 10 years we brought this that is the National Biosphere Reserve program in 1986. Later what happened was the local inhabitants for sustainable use that is in the biosphere reserve you need to have a sustainable development and hence you should educate and give awareness to the people to sustainably use all the products inside the biosphere reserve and hence this national biosphere reserve program is working towards that and then moving to the criteria for selection of biosphere reserve i already said y'all india will select a particular area as a biosphere reserve so what are the criteria under that so the first criteria is the core group of experts that is people there will be a committee right that people will designate that area on the basis of primary criteria and then the secondary criteria. So what and all comes under the primary criteria? So under primary criteria, it is effectively protected and minimal disturbed core area. So basically there should be a core area and that core area should not be disturbed by anything. That is the human interference over there should be very, very less. And then the additional land and water area for research. So if there is a land or water area surrounding the core area, that area can be used for research activities. And then the core area should be large because that area should be of minimal disturbance. So it should be of large and that area should consider different trophic levels of ecosystem. Already we saw about what is an ecosystem and the trophic levels inside the ecosystem. So it should have different trophic levels inside that. So normally in the primary criteria, what should happen is it should have a core area. This core area should not be disturbed by any human interference and surrounding the core area, you will have a land or water area. That area can be used for research or educational activities. And lately this core area should be large in size and it should consider of different trophic levels in an ecosystem. And then moving to the secondary criteria, it is there should be rare and endangered species. That is we already saw in the IUCN list, some species are listed as endangered. So the rare and endangered species should prevail in the biosphere reserve in that area and then the diversity of soil and microclimate. So if there is a soil over there, 
and uh, and if there is a microclimate over there that diversity should be huge and then preservation of traditional tribal so there should be a traditional tribal people prevailing in that to protect the forest ecosystem or land ecosystem or water ecosystem inside the biosphere reserve so these are the primary criteria and secondary criteria for designating an area as a biosphere reserve and then later moving into the structure of a biosphere reserve so the structure of Biosphere reserve is categorized into three types. First thing is the core, and the second thing is the buffer zone, and the third thing is the transitional zone. So, what is a core zone? I already said y'all. What is a core zone? So, if there is a biosphere reserve over here, the center should constitute the core area, and the second layer over here is the buffer zone, and the third is the transitional zone. And then under the core area, this should be undisturbed. Very very important. This area should be undisturbed, and then. there should be numerous plants and animal varieties inside the core area and lately there should be a higher order of predators and in the core area you should have a higher order of predators such as hawk lion tiger so these are the higher order of predators and then it should be free from human pressure so this core area is a very very important area it should be undisturbed and should and it should have a numerous plant and animal variety and higher form of predators and finally it should be away from human pressures core area is very very important so after core area comes the buffer zone so what is a buffer zone so buffer zone is to protect the core area so there will be a core area here right so surrounding that area you will have a buffer zone this zone is to protect this core zone and then research and educational activities can be carried out in the buffer zone so in this area research and educational activities can be carried out but recreational activities like tourism should be limited and then lastly moving into the transitional zone about transitional zone it is the last part inside the biosphere reserve so what and all you can do inside the transition zone is you can do cropping you can have settlements managed forest and recreational activities so we saw that the biosphere reserve is constituted into three zones that is the core zone the buffer zone and the transitional zone so in this transitional zone you can do all these activities and then moving to the next point it is the indian national map committee so there is a committee called as indian national man and animal biosphere committee constituted by the central government which identifies new sites to be added inside the biosphere reserve so for for a place or a site or any site to be added inside the biosphere reserve this indian national map committee which is constituted by the central government will identify the new site to be placed inside the biosphere reserve and then later the unesco will approve that so the management of biosphere reserve is carried out by central government or the respected union territory and then what does the central government do so the central government it will manage the finance and the technical expertise so basically the management that is all the things inside the biosphere reserve is managed by the respective central government or the union territory and the finance and the technical expertise is managed by the central government and then moving to the next topic world network of biosphere reserve so we have dealt with all these topics now we are going to the world network of biosphere reserves w n b r so what is the world network of biosphere reserves so i already said you all that in india we have 18 biosphere reserves in that 11 biosphere reserves are categorized under the world network of biosphere reserves so the unesco categorizes the biosphere reserves from various parts of the world club it together and puts into the list called world network of biosphere reserves that is called as wnbr so accordingly the world network the icc of map of unesco that is all the participating country will enlist the biosphere reserve list inside first and then send it to the unesco map program they will finally approve the biosphere reserve based on the criteria which we already saw and now 
the participation is only voluntarily so you can voluntarily participate or come out from the committee now moving to the biodiversity hotspot so what is called as a biodiversity hotspot now we are done with world network of biosphere reserves and then now we are going to hotspots so what is a hotspot as we saw how to add a reserve inside the biosphere reserve any new site into the biosphere reserve there is a condition for adding hotspots also so what are the two conditions so basically there are two criteria to be added so basically this concept was introduced by norman mayers in 1888 very very important point to be noted down so the concept of biodiversity hotspot was introduced by norman mayers in 1988 and then there are two criteria for any site to be under the hotspot list so what are the two criteria so first thing is at least there should be 1500 species of vascular plants that is the plants inside that should contain 1500 species of vascular plants plants so what is a vascular plant vascular is nothing but should contain xylem and phloem basically it will take all the nutrients and supply it to various parts of the plant so that is called as xylem and phloem so these are the vascular plants how much it should have 1500 species list and then the second thing is should be the degree of threat first thing is species endemism this this plant should be endemic only to that area and hence you can classify that as a hotspot and then the second criteria is at least 70 percentage of original habitat should be under loss so there should be a threat prevailing inside that place and there should be a 70 percentage of original habitat that is if any species is staying inside that land 70 percentage of that species should be under the loss condition or the threat condition so these are the two condition listed by norman mayers to put any site into a hotspot list and then moving into the uh, characteristic of hotspot each biodiversity hotspot has remarkable events that is the endemism over there will be remarkable that that is there will be various species inside the hotspots and then the endemic flora and fauna struggling to survive this is related to the second point because 70% is under loss that is the habitat the place in which they are living is under loss and hence they are struggling to strive or live so this is called as the characteristic of the bio hotspots and then there is another topic called as the hottest of hotspots so what is the hottest of hotspots so some hotspots are much richer than the others so if you compare one hotspot with the other hotspot over here this hotspot will be rich in flora and fauna when compared to this one that is the endemism over here will be very rich that is called as hottest of hotspots and then there are five factors in which you can put some site inside the hottest of hotspots so what are the factors like how we saw we have two criteria for enlisting a site inside a hotspot we have five criterias for enlisting a hotspot into the hottest of hotspots so what is that there should be endemic plants you already know about this there should be endemic plants and then there should be endemic vertebrates that is which is having um, animals which are having backbones are called as vertebrates so there should be endemism even inside that endemism is nothing but it should be living in only that area that is the habitat should be only in that area and then there should be endemic plants to area ratio that is they'll compare the plants with the area in which they are living and then they'll compare the vertebrates to the area ratio and then finally the remaining primary vegetation that is the basically the producers a primary vegetation so all these will be taken into account for enlisting a site into the hottest of hotspot site so this is very important there are totally eight hottest of hotspots in the world so what are the eight hottest of hotspots so basically it is madagascar first one next one is philippines third one is sunda land and then brazil's atlantic forest caribbean islands indo burma region western ghats and below you have sri lanka and then eastern arc and coastal forest of tanzania or kenya so these are the eight hotspots so let's come again so first thing is madagascar philippines 
Sunda land, Brazil's Atlantic forest area, and then Caribbean, Indo Burma, Western Ghats, and Sri Lanka, and then finally the eastern arc and coastal forest of Tanzania, Kenya, that is in Africa. So, totally there are eight hotspot regions. And coming to India, Indian biodiversity hotspots. So, India has four biodiversity hotspots listing. This is not the hottest of hotspots. There are only totally eight hottest of hotspots. And in that Western Ghats, that is Indian Western Ghats comes under the eight hottest of hotspots. But in India, we have four major biodiversity hotspots. What are the four major biodiversity hotspots? The first one is Himalayas, the top. And the second one is Indo-Burma region. Already we saw Indo-Burma region came in the hottest of hotspots. And then we already saw Western Ghats and Sri Lanka in the hottest of hotspots. And finally, in India, we have the Sundar lands. So, these are the four major biodiversity hotspot region in India. So, in India, we saw about the four bio hotspots. So, first thing is the Eastern Himalayan region. So, what and all area it comprises is Bhutan, Northeastern India, South, East and Central Nepal will comprise of the Eastern Himalayan region. And then the next one is the Indo-Burma region. So, from East Bangladesh to Malaysia, this region will extend. And specifically in India, it will be Northeastern India, Myanmar, South China, Cambodia, Vietnam, and then Thailand. So all these region comprises of the Indo-Burma hotspot. And then about the Western Ghats and Sri Lanka hotspot, it is the Western Ghats which is otherwise called as the Shayadri Hills. And then coming to the Sri Lanka, it is the highlands of the Southwestern Sri Lanka which comprises of the Western Ghat and the Sri Lanka hotspot. And then Moving to the next important topic called as the cold spot. So we've done with hot spot. So what is a cold spot? So we already know what is a hot spot. In a hot spot, we saw that the first point is species endemism and the second point is the threat. So under species endemism, we, we saw that it should be endemic. Specifically, 1500 species of vascular plants should be endemic to that region. So over here, over there, it is endemic, but over here, it will be low diversity. So, in hot spot, there will be high diversity. In cold spots, there will be low diversity. That is, there will be only few organisms or species prevailing over there. And those few organisms also will be undergoing the process called as threat. So, there will be threat and low diversity. And since the species or the Organism is very low. Conservation efforts has to be done because of the harsh prevailing climate or the environmental factors. So this is called as the cold spots. So we've done with cold spots. And then moving on to the last topic of the lesson, it is the World Heritage Sites. So we already know about the World Heritage Site. What is a World Heritage Site and who designates the World Heritage Site? So basically the UNESCO's World Heritage List is a site of any area. So any area can be enlisted inside the World Heritage List. And then it is done because of the outstanding universal value. If it has a universal value, that site is taken and put into the World Heritage List. And then this World Heritage Site List was uh, brought into, uh, to, the idea was brought in 1972 and it was enforced in 1975. So what and all you can bring into the World Heritage Site list is, first one is you can bring in monuments, you can bring in museum, you can bring in biodiversity area and then the state government should protect these sites. So the state government or the union territories should protect the sites in which the sites are prevailing. And then the first list was composed in 1978. So the idea was brought in 72, enforced in 75 and then the first list was prepared in 1978 and basically it is prepared under two headings or two criteria that is based on cultural and natural. So there are six factors on cultural and there are four factors on natural. So until 2004 this was so until 2004, 
this was taken into a separate category that is we had six categories under cultural and four categories under natural but the next year that is 2005 they clubbed all the factors together that is the six and this four together and brought under 10 list so what are the 10 lists encrypted so that you can put any site into the unesco world heritage site list so we look into the list but then how you will put a site inside the world heritage site list so in these 10 criteria it should satisfy at least one criteria so any one criteria is enough to put into a uh, to put that area into the world heritage site list so what are the 10 lists first thing is it should be a masterpiece of human creative genius so that monument or anything related to human interference it should be a masterpiece and then the interchange of human values for example if there is an area here if there is an area here if there is an interchange of human values between these two areas and that is very very unique and looked down upon the world that can be put into the list and then civilization disappearance if there was a huge civilization prevailing here like indus civilization mesopotamian civilization so that can be brought into the heritage list and then the type of building like the Taj Mahal so those buildings are very unique you can bring that into the list and then the traditional human settlement human settlement area also can be brought in the literary works can be brought in the natural beauty for example a railway station can be brought into the natural heritage list and then uh, eighth one is the major stages of earth's history so there will be stages or evolution that is going on in our earth so that earth's history also can be placed into the heritage list site and then significant ongoing ecological and biological process so if there is an ongoing ecological and biological process in that place present at now so that also can be added and then lastly it should be containing significant natural habitats so that place should be made of a natural habitat area and it should be significant and it should be unique so if it satisfies any one criteria under this it can be brought into the unesco's world heritage sites we have now dealt with the 10 criteria for enlisting any site into the world network of heritage sites now let's move into the international year of biodiversity and international day of biodiversity so in the international year 2010 is designated as the international year of biodiversity and coming to the day it is the 22nd may so the united nations general assembly has designated this day that is the 22nd of may as the international day of biodiversity to create awareness among people that is to create awareness globally and conserve the biodiversity in our area so we have dealt with this chapter we have dealt with all these topics and lastly we have dealt with the world heritage sites and we are done with the topic protected area networks so in our next chapter let's deal with the next lesson thank you for watching